So, uh, but now we're going to finish up uh, in Acts this morning, uh, our last message out of that. So the title of the message this morning is The End, <laughs> Jesus and Grace. The End, Jesus and Grace. If you've got uh, a bulletin uh, this morning, we'll fill some blanks in along there. You're welcome to follow along the cross-references and kind of fill those things in. Uh, I want you to look with me, if you would, um, in Acts chapter 28. Look at verse 16. I'm going to read that, and then I'll, we'll pray, and we'll get started. So Acts chapter 28, and then verse number 16. It says, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So here we are, the great apostle, the story, his story that began when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus has ended with him delivered in chains to Rome. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for this portion of Scripture. God, thank you for this, for the whole book of Acts, for all the lessons we've been able to glean from it, the challenges that you have spoken to our hearts about. God, thank you for the work that you've done in my own life, the transforming. God, thank you for the Bible. We're so grateful that when we get together, we don't have to just hear somebody's opinion we don't have to just speculate about what you're like or about what you want. That we can open your word and we can hear directly from you. Lord, that's what we need. God, that's what we want. It's to just hear directly from you. Lord, I always need your help. And that is very true today. God, we need you and we need grace. I'm going to try to teach on you and, and on your grace, but I can't do it without you and without that grace. Please help me. Lord, we pray that you would help all of us to take in whatever it is that you want to say. God, I have an outline. I, I have things planned, but... But these are your people. They, they've come to hear from you and only you know truly what we need. So Lord, would you take this service now and would you speak directly into every heart and mind and God, that we would not just gain knowledge this morning, but that we would be changed. We pray that you would just do the resurrection work that only you can. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, again, if you want to follow along in your outlines this morning, or if you're watching the live stream, those bullets are attached to the newsletter every week, so you can print that out uh, and follow along that way if you'd like to do that. So here we are. Uh, we've seen in verse 16 that Paul has arrived in Rome, and I'll just remind you quickly uh, how we got here. Uh, Paul went bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, even though he knew that terrible things were going to befall him there. He, he didn't necessarily know the specifics, but the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that bad things were going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. But he was, and they begged him, some of the fellow Christians begged him not to go, but he said, I am, I am bound to go. And so he went to Jerusalem, and it's true, he wasn't there for very long before they accused him of defiling the temple. They drug him out, falsely accused him of defiling the temple, and they drug him out in the street, and they were going to beat him to death right there in the street when the Roman guards came and they rescued him. And then he almost started a riot from the steps by trying to reason with his fellow countrymen. So the soldiers pulled him inside the castle and they began to beat him to try to get the truth out of him. They found out that he was a Roman citizen. They said, ah! So they sent him to the governor for trial. The governor tried him. They brought in, they almost started another riot. Then there was the assassination plot to kill him. So they had to send him under guard off to the Roman capital. He got there, had another trial with, with uh, Felix there. There's a second assassination attempt to try to kill him, which he survives that. That governor keeps him unjustly imprisoned for two years, hoping to get a bribe. Then the new governor comes in, appointed by Nero. And then he puts him on trial. He's going to send him back to Jerusalem, where he's certainly going to get killed. So he has to appeal to Caesar. So they put him on a boat heading for Rome. That's the start here down at the bottom of Jerusalem. They sail up and they head across the sea. About the time they make it to Crete, a terrible storm overtakes the boat. They're nearly sunk after two weeks of fighting the storm, not seeing the sun or the stars for two weeks, not eating anything. Then God reveals to Paul that they're not going to die. 
they're going to lose the ship, but everybody on the boat's going to survive. And so he tells them, hey, cheer up, let's have some dinner. And so they have that wonderful feast in the middle of the storm. We looked at that last week. Then they, are, they make it safe to shore, despite the sailors trying to abandon them on the boat, despite the guards wanting to kill all the prisoners, despite the terrible waves and storm, they make it safe to shore, just as God said. There, he's almost immediately attacked by a poisonous viper, which he shakes off into the fire and is fine. So the natives go from thinking he must be a murderer to that he must be a god. They end up being well-treated in the home of the governor of that island, who after three months, they let the winter and all the storms pass. They put him on a boat and they get to Rome. So in verse 16, when we read, and when they came to Rome, just understand it was a bit of a doing to get there. <laughs> Ever since Paul met Jesus on that road to Damascus, and he went from trying to destroy the Christian faith to being probably the greatest missionary ever. We know him today as the apostle to the Gentiles. It has been a wild ride for the apostle Paul. So it's fitting that here on what is maybe his last journey, that it was a wild ride also. Now he's in the capital of the whole world at the time. He's in Rome. We know it as the eternal city. He's there in chains. He's been brought to stand trial in front of the most powerful man in the world, the wicked emperor Nero. But Paul, even though he's been brought to Rome in chains, is not really there against his will. He knows that Jesus has sent him there. In fact, while he was in Jerusalem in prison, the Lord appeared to him and told him that he was sending him to be a witness in Rome. And now here he is. In verse 17 and through 20, we're going to find that he's going to describe himself as being bound for the hope of Israel. Bound for the hope of Israel. Look at it with me, if you would, in verse 17. And it came to pass that after three days, so he gets there, they get settled three days. Paul calls the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, though I've committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, Yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And so he says, so he calls the, the chief, the, the leaders of the Jewish people that are there in, in Rome, the, the Jewish diaspora in Rome, and he gets them all together. And that's, you'll remember, that's Paul's general mode of operating. Anytime he went into a new city anywhere in the world, he would first go to the Jewish people. Whatever Jews lived in that city, he would go to them first and preach the gospel. And that pattern is continuing here. So he calls all the Jews that are together in Rome, the, the leaders of it, he calls them all together. And then he says, hey, I want you to know that I'm here in chains from Jerusalem, and I'm not guilty of what they've accused me of. I haven't broken any laws. I haven't violated any customs, even of our nation. And he says, but I was accused of it, and so they handed me over to the Romans. Verse 18, the Romans, when they examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. He says, the Romans have basically already found me innocent three times. Verse 19, but when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Now, this is actually a nice way of saying they were planning to murder me on the road back to Jerusalem. And in order to escape that, if you remember the story, in order to escape that plot, he had to appeal to Caesar so that the governor, Festus, wouldn't send him just back to Jerusalem. So he says, I was constrained. I, I, it was necessary for me to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. He says, I, I didn't appeal to Caesar to try to make Israel look bad. I'm not trying to make the Jewish people look bad. I just tried not to get murdered. Right? That's what he's saying here in a nice way. Verse 20, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and speak with you because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And I think it's really interesting and really wonderful here that he, he doesn't view himself as a victim. He's not saying this is not a, in fact, he's actually kind of gone out of his way to make these people that have falsely accused him and tried to murder him a couple of times. He's gone kind of a ways to not make him look too bad. And he he's, doesn't see himself as a victim here. He's not here against his will. He says, I'm here for the hope of Israel. I am bound for the hope of Israel. 
The uh, word hope here in the Greek is elpis, which if you uh, were here for our uh, Christmas series, uh, the Christmas series um, last Christmas was a thrill of hope. And we talked about this word elpis and what it means. Um, if you weren't here, if you need a little refresher, I'll remind you that biblical hope is not just optimism. It's not human optimism. That when the Bible talks, when the Bible uses the word elpis, when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about a biblical hope, which is waiting with certain expectation for God to show up because of his faithfulness. So a biblical hope is not just, oh, I hope things are going to turn out or I hope there's going to be bacon for breakfast or anything like that. It's not, it's not optimism. El peace is the certain expectation. There's no question mark in biblical hope. Biblical hope is a certain thing. But what are we certain about? We are not necessarily, oh, peace is not certain that things are going to get better. You can be optimistic that things are going to get better, but that's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is the certainty that God's going to show up, that God's going to be present. And the reason we can be certain of God's presence is not because we've done the right things. If, you, if, your, if your hope is based on, well, I did enough of the right things, I was praying enough, I was in church enough, I was reading my Bible enough, I didn't commit too many sins, and therefore I hope that God will be present. That's not biblical hope. That's optimism based, that's optimism that you've done well enough that God will be with you. El peace is the certainty that God's going to be there because of his faithfulness. It's rooted in the fact that he is the faithful one, that he does what he says. So when Paul, that's the, and this is the word that Paul uses, he says, I'm here for the hope of Israel, for the, for the certain expectation that God is going to show up. Israel nationally has rejected the Messiah. They've rejected Christ. But he says, I'm here for the hope of Israel, the certain expectation that God is going to show up. And the example we used for El Peace, you, you may remember, I mean, so hope is Jesus Christ. That's what it is in a word. So when he says, I'm here for the hope of Israel, he's saying, I'm here for Jesus. I'm here for Jesus. Now, these Jews don't know that yet, but he's going to get there in a minute. And when I think about hope, you'll remember maybe that we talked about that the Bible actually says that the hope is more certain than the sunrise. Our, our hope as Christians, our certainty that God is going to show up, it's a more certain thing than the sun is going to rise. And it's a continual encouragement to me. I, I have struggled with hope. I'm very damaged in this way, just with my experiences with Evangeline. But, but since the Lord gave me these verses, uh, it's really helped me. When I, when I, if I'm out with Evangeline, we're up in the morning. Oftentimes we are. Um, and I, and I, you know, so I took this picture at 516 in the morning out on one of my drives with Evangeline. And I thought, the sun's going to come up. And then by 528, the sun had still not come up, but it was brighter. I was sure that it was going to come. And that's the way the biblical hope is. We know the sun's going to come up. Maybe not when, but as we get closer, it gets brighter and brighter. And so Paul says, I'm here. I'm bound with this chain. I'm attached to this Roman guard for the hope of Israel. Jesus is the hope of Israel. In Jeremiah 17, 13, the prophet, it's there in your outline, the prophet says, O Lord, the hope of Israel. Did you know that that's one of the names of God? One of the titles of the Lord is the hope of Israel. He, he is, he's the hope, the Yahal of Israel. And, and that's the Yahal is the Hebrew counterpart to El Peace. It's, it's the same idea, the confident expectation that God is going to show up because of his faithfulness. He's that to Israel. It says, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. They that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. When we understand who Jesus is, we understand that, listen, if you get healing from somewhere else, you can get sick again. If you get saved from some other kind of disaster, you can end up in disaster again. But when Jesus heals you, you're healed for sure. When Jesus saves you, you're saved indeed. 
And so that makes him the hope of Israel because Israel has been into judgment and out of judgment and saved and back into trouble and healed and sick again and up and down. But when Jesus comes, it's all done and well and good. And Jesus, by the way, so you say, well, he came the first time. He was rejected nationally, but I don't know if you know this. He's coming again. Yeah, and that's, and the hope of Israel is that when he comes, he's going to set it all right. He's going to put the house into order. And that is going to happen. Joel 3, 16. Uh, Pastor Farouk will get there eventually uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, and Joel 3, 16 says this. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And God has not abandoned his people. So then he, as he has the Jewish leaders there gathered to him, he is going to talk with them about what do they think of Jesus? What do they think about Jesus? That's what he, so he's here for the hope of Israel. They would have recognized that probably as a messianic uh, reference. And so he's going to talk to them about what do they think of Jesus. Look at verse 21. They said unto him, so he says, I'm not guilty of anything, but this is why I'm here. Verse 21, the Jewish leaders say back to him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. See, we don't know who you are. Isn't that amazing? After all the effort to assassinate him and to slander him and to put him on trial, they don't even bother sending a letter to Rome to make the accusation. They're just glad to be rid of him. And plus, they really don't have any evidence. I don't know what they would put in that letter in any case. So he says, so we don't know. Verse 22, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For it's concerning this sect. So their idea of Christianity at this point is that it's some sort of a weird cult version of Judaism. Because I know, I mean, at this point, most believers in the world are still mostly Jewish people. And so there's this idea in Roman culture, and, and even among the unconverted Jews themselves, that, that Christianity is just kind of like some bizarre new interpretation of Moses and the law. And they don't understand what it is. They think it's some sect of Judaism, right? So they say, we've heard about this Christian Jesus thing. They obviously don't understand it very well. For we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So all we know is that all the reports that we've gotten about this Jesus person are all bad. Which is a reminder about what Jesus said in Luke chapter 2. Or not what Jesus said actually, but what was said about Jesus at his birth. You remember when Mary and Joseph, when they brought Jesus to the temple to circumcise him and buy him back from the Lord, and then and, uh, Anna and Simeon are there. Remember, they, they've been waiting for the consolation of Israel, for the hope of Israel. They come and they take Jesus up in their arms and they bless God and they bless the parents. And Simeon prophesies over him. And look, I, I'll just remind you of what he said in Luke 2.34. And Simeon blessed them and he said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against, yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And so that was true from the moment of Jesus' birth, through his ministry, to his crucifixion, through the resurrection. And now, as Apostle Paul stands in Rome, Jesus is a sign that is being spoken against everywhere. They say, all that we know is that it's spoken against everywhere. But that's actually one of the signs that Jesus was who he said he was. That, that in itself is a fulfillment of prophecy about Jesus Christ. It's, it's interesting. You know, you can talk about God today in general terms. Have you noticed that? Although that's getting less popular. But, but broadly still, you could, if you said to somebody, well, God bless you or or, well, thank God, or something like that. You know, in the culture and society, you can kind of do that still. But if somebody starts talking about Jesus, all the oxygen goes out of the room. Have you noticed that? Why do you think that is? That doesn't happen if you talk about Buddha. It doesn't happen if you, if you talk about Santa Claus, right? There's something about Jesus that's still a sign that's spoken against. 
It's actually really wonderful evidence that Jesus was who he said he was. Because otherwise, why do people care so much? Why do the unconverted care that much? All right. So Paul here is in Rome. What do you think he's going to do in Rome? Preach. Praise God. Amen. You guys have been following along in this series. You know, it doesn't matter how he got there. If they just finished trying to beat him to death, if he was drug or if he went on his own, when he gets there, he's going to preach. I like the apostle Paul. <laughs> so in verse 23 here, we find that Paul is preaching in Rome. Here he is, comes in chains through all this harrowing journey, and he's going to preach. Look at verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And you think I preach a long time. <laughs> Nobody yet has fallen out of a window and died while I was preaching. So, <laughs> something to aim for. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, so here he is. He's in, and he, he's not allowed to leave. He's under house arrest. They've got him in chains. And they've got a guard, a Roman soldier attached to him. And I'm, I don't know, but I'm expecting to meet that Roman soldier in heaven. You can't be chained to the Apostle Paul for a couple of years. I mean, I just think, boy, that guy. But anyway, so, so there he is, he, and the people have to come to him. They fill the house up, and he just starts, starts with Moses, goes through the prophets, using their own scriptures, using the Old Testament to preach the gospel, to tell them about Jesus. It reminds me of something that Paul actually said earlier in the book of Romans, in a letter he wrote to the Roman Christians in Romans 1.15. He said this, So much as is it in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He says, hey, Roman Christians, I want to come and preach the gospel to you. And I don't think he knew how he was going to get there, but he was ready. And so when he got there, he began to preach. He said, why? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's not embarrassed to be in mighty Rome, in the eternal city that sits on seven hills. He's not embarrassed to be there among so much wealth and power and opulence and for him to just be some guy from Jerusalem, from the far reaches of the empire, a barbarian to these Romans. He's not embarrassed to be in the capital city of the world and tell them about Jesus. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation. You want to get right with God? There's only one way to do it, and that's Jesus Christ. He says the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first, but also to the Greek. He said, the Romans are so condescending. You know, for them, if you were Roman, you were Roman. And if you were anything else, you were a barbarian. And, and I don't know if you know that, but barbarian, the, the word actually comes, um, you know, like we might say blah, 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 blah. Well, well, the Romans would say bar, 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 if you weren't making any sense. And so barbarian is literally the people that go blah, 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 blah. It's the bar, 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 barbarians, right? That was it. And for the Roman worldview, that was it. It was Rome and the blah, 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 blahs, right? Paul says, hey, Jesus will even save those condescending Romans. Praise God. All right. The Jew first, but also to the Greek. All right. And so we see then that he's going to make this transition in verses 24 to 29 about the gospel going to the Gentiles. Look at chapter 28, look at verse 24. And some, so he's preaching Jesus, he's using Moses and the prophets to preach to him. It says in 24 that some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. That's the pattern, isn't it? When you preach the gospel, it doesn't matter how good of a job you do. You could literally be the Apostle Paul, and not everyone's going to believe the message. Some believed, some didn't. Verse 25, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. And it's not one word, it's one thought. He gave him one sort of parting thought here, and this was it. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. This is a sad, sad prophecy. Uh, and it's been largely true of the whole history of Israel. I mean, the whole nation, national history, you can see this theme repeated over and over and over again. They have the oracles of God. 
It's their history of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's their history of slavery in Egypt and of the signs and the wonders that God did of walking on dry ground across the Red Sea of God raining the manna from heaven and bringing water for them out of the rock, of delivering them over and over. Theirs is King David and King Solomon. Theirs are the writings of Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel. That's their history. It's personal to them. And God says, yet for all the light, they're going to close their eyes. For all that I have done for them, they're going to harden their hearts. For all that I have said to them, they're going to plug their ears. I mean, it's just heartbreaking stuff. And Paul here in Rome, he's losing his ability to decide where he goes. Now where he's going to go, where he's going to preach is no longer up to him. He's not able to go to the synagogues to preach. If he's going to preach the gospel, they're going to have to come to him. And the implication here in the text is that after all the Jewish leaders came the first time and heard that many of them went and they never came back to see him again. And since he's in chains and can't go to them, that's the end of the gospel preaching to them. They've closed their ears to it. He says in verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Instead of hearing further, now remember, he's been teaching Jesus not out of the New Testament. He's teaching them Jesus out of Moses and out of the prophets. But they went and instead of coming back to hear more from Paul, now they're just going to reason among themselves. The first church, I'll remind you, the very first church was in Jerusalem, and it was almost 100% ethnically Jewish. Almost 100%. As the gospel spread outward from Jerusalem, it stayed mostly Jewish. Some Gentiles did get saved, but they kind of mostly had to adopt all the Jewish sort of customs. Even Paul, who we know is the apostle of the Gentiles, always went to the Jews in each city first. But here, Acts closes, the sad majority of the nation of Israel has completed their rejection of Christ. The rejection of Jesus Christ that began in Christ's ministry, that culminated in the leadership's rejection of him and his crucifixion, is sort of completed nationally here with the rejection of the, Jewish, the majority of the Jewish people that are spread around the world. The main gospel work from here on out is to the Gentile peoples. Of course, Jews can still get saved, and many do. There are Messianic Jews, there are Jews for Jesus. There's, there's many Jewish people still today getting saved, and praise God. Praise God for anybody that gets saved. Somebody say amen. amen. And that, that's exciting when that happens. But nationally, as, as, a, as, a, as a whole ethnic group, the Jewish people have largely continued their rejection of Jesus Christ as their Messiah, the, the serious Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come. And this was to the benefit of us Gentiles. We are wild branches that can be grafted into the tree of God's family. And I want to say this before we leave this part. God is not done with Israel. They are blind in part, but only until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Uh, Romans 11.25 to the Christians there at Rome makes this very clear. He says this, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so shall all Israel be saved. Nationally, the, they're going to get saved. That's, but that's going to happen in the tribulation. Things are going to get real, real bad before they finally say, you know what? <laughs> I think Jesus was the Messiah. <laughs> and nationally, that's, that's going to happen. Now, if you have questions about that, I have good news for you. Starting April 11th, <laughs> we're going to hit some of this, this prophecy stuff and we'll deal with more of that when we get there. Okay. So let's keep going on Acts here. To, let's finish off the chapter. Finish the book of Acts. Verses 30 through 31 concludes the chapter. So we've reached the end. Paul 
preaching and teaching about Jesus Christ. Verse 30, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and he received all that came in unto him. So Paul's really being taken, sometimes when we think of Paul in prison, we picture him in a cell with bars where it's cold and ugly. And he spent plenty of time in prisons exactly like that. But because of the unique circumstances of this particular thing, at, the Romans have allowed him to stay in a house. Now he's got to pay for it. <laughs> it's his money that's coming in from some of the churches. We get, you catch glimpses of that when he like writes to the Ephesians and thanks them for the funds that they've supplied to like take care of him and keep him in food and shelter. Uh, that's some of what he's talking about here. But he is chained to a guard and he cannot leave his house. So it's, it's correct that he's in prison, but it's, his, his circumstance is actually okay. But he's there. He receives all that comes into. They're not preventing him from receiving guests. Verse 31, and what's he doing? It will surprise nobody to see that he is preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Even that guard that he was chained to couldn't tell him no. Praise the Lord. It's unclear, and that's where the chapter ends. That's where the book of Acts ends. That's it. It's unclear what happened next. There is some evidence to suggest that Paul actually, after these two years, might have been acquitted and then taken another missionary journey. Not back to Jerusalem, but maybe further west. There's some, there's some suggestion that maybe he may have traveled around a little bit more after this. Before he was arrested again in the great Roman persecution of the Christians under Nero. If you know, so Nero's the emperor when he arrives in Rome, and he's a wicked man, but the persecution against the Christians has not really started yet. The, the Christians are still kind of a cult. The Romans are not real sure about. They'll persecute them if something comes up, but there's no organized effort to exterminate Christianity yet. That comes under Nero in a couple of years when he blames the burning of Rome on the church, and then after, and they it's unspeakable the things that they began to do to try to wipe out Christianity under Nero. But it, so Paul possibly went on another missionary journey before getting caught by Nero again, coming back and being martyred in Rome. It's also possible that he remained here under house arrest in Rome for several more years and then was martyred in Rome. Either way, we know that Paul's journey ended here in Rome, whether it was right after this or a little bit later. So what application do we want to make? We've got about 15 more minutes this morning. I want to make some application as we close out not only this chapter, uh, but as we close out the whole series. You know we've been doing um, the world turned upside down. We've been talking about upside down values and then how do we live right side up. This morning we're going to do it just a slightly differently as we end this series. I want to look at the upside down early church. The Acts... The story of Acts tells us basically it begins with Jesus Christ's ascension from the Mount of Olives. They watch him go up and he sends them to wait the filling of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And then that's, and then that's really the church is really energized at that point and goes forward. And then it leads us up to basically the start of the great persecutions against the church. So in some ways, this ends the chapter kind of on that, that first generation of the church. We want to make some application from that because they're the ones, remember when Paul, when they when he arrived in Antioch, they said, those that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. And so that testimony of the world upside down, but as we've learned, and I hope this has been clear through the series, that even though they said, well, they've turned the world upside down, that really they're turning it right side up. So this is not an upside down church as much as it is the right side up church. Those that have gone from living upside down to living right side up. There's kind of a long portion of scripture here. I want to read it. And we'll make it just a couple points of application as we go as we consider the church. And then we'll consider specifically the life of the Apostle Paul as he's been sort of the focus of the last half of the book of Acts. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's all printed there in your outline for you. Or if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles, we're going to spend a few minutes here in 2 Corinthians 4. This is one of the last letters that Paul wrote. He loved the church at Corinth. They'd had a lot of problems. 
the book of 1 Corinthians is very helpful to pastors because he deals, this church had all kinds of problems. And so as Paul is writing to straighten out all these problems at the church of Corinth, we get a lot of good instruction on how church is to be run. And then uh, in the second letter, we find out that they did make those changes and Paul's really giving them some encouragement. These are his last words to that church. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Paul says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, but the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us couple thoughts here. The idea is that we want to live a life that's about Jesus and it's about his message. And that's what he's saying here in 2 Corinthians. He says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Life right side up is not about yourself. If you are living just for you, you are going to face such awful disappointment. Such terrible, terrible emptiness. It doesn't, I know that it seems upside down. But the more you try to fill your life with what you want and what you need and what you like and what you think and what you believe, the emptier and emptier and emptier you will become. The most miserable people in the world today are those who got everything they wanted. They got all the money, they got all the power, they got all the fame, and they are desperately, desperately unhappy. They're so empty. And they're still trying to fill it with themselves. And you cannot do it. And it seems upside down to say, don't make your life about yourself. Make your life about Jesus. You say, well, but if I make my life about Jesus instead of about me, what about me? But the secret to living right side up is that when your life is about Jesus, it's, that's where the glory is. That's where the peace is. That's where the love is. That's where the joy is. That's where the fullness is found. A life that's about Christ and about his message. And by the way, Christ and his message, we have that treasure. We have it in jars of clay. The Bible calls them earthen vessels. I like, I like that. An earthen vessel, it's a, it's, a, it's a pot that's just made out of the earth. Do you know that that's a fair description of you and me? We, we are made out of dirt. Chemically, that's basically true. Dirt and water. You know what you get if you mix dirt and water? Clay. Or a person. <laughs> Depending on who's doing the mixing. When you go and I go out and mix water and dirt, we get mud. We get clay. When Jesus does it, that's how he got you. <laughs> this body that makes you special. It's not this body that makes you valuable. So much energy is expended in this world on the body. The way we look, the way the body feels, whether it's healthy or sick. And listen, all that stuff, I'm not saying it's not important. Obviously that stuff matters, but it's mud. It's clay. From dust you came to dust you'll return. If you want to get something out of this life, if you want to get something out of this jar of clay, quit worrying so much about the mud and think about what's stored inside of it. And as a Christian, you have this incredible opportunity that what can be stored inside is Jesus. He's willing to put that treasure of glory into a jar of mud, into you and into me. Wow. 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 He says that the same God that commanded the light to shine out of the darkness shined in our hearts. And we have, verse 7, we have that treasure in earthen vessels. 
that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Never forget where the excellent power comes from. It doesn't come from the clay. It comes from the treasure that's inside. And even though that's true, though, the Christian life can still be very hard. And Paul talks about this. And this is the testimony of the early church and of those that want to be faithful to Christ throughout history. Look at verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. We're confused. We don't understand. But we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Did you know that resurrections are super exciting? <laughs> resurrections are super exciting. I mean, our whole faith is built on the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you don't get a resurrection unless there's a death first. If there's going to be resurrection power, something's going to have to die. And we don't like that part. We don't want the death. We just want the resurrection power. But my friends, Christians, brothers and sisters, I am telling you, something's got to die before it can be made alive again. And if you want the resurrection power, we want the life of Christ, we also are going to have to face the death of Christ. Jesus did not just come in trained in glory to receive the worship of men. Now he's coming that way the second time. But the first time he came lowly, made in the likeness of men. He came in a jar of clay. Why? So that he could be broken for you and me. So that we might participate in his death and then also in his resurrection life. But the Christian life is not, listen, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you are looking for someone that's going to promise you an easy life where nothing ever goes wrong, you should not be following somebody that was nailed to an old rugged cross. I do not know where modern preachers get this idea that if you follow Jesus, everything's going to go well. What happened to Jesus? Like, what do we think we're signing up for? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He said that before he'd been crucified, before the cross was a symbol to Christians, before we started putting it at the front of our sanctuaries and on top of our buildings, the cross was a tool of execution. And Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And you say, I don't want to die. Well, guess what's on the other side of the cross? Resurrection power. And that's the life of the Christian. There's death, there's trouble, there's sorrow, there's loss, there's grief, there's suffering, and there's redemption out of all of it. And you say, well, I don't want the grief and the loss and the suffering and the despair. Guess what? You're going to get it anyway. Yeah. I, I hate to break this to you if you haven't figured this out already, but life is frequently a bummer. There's so much grief and sadness and loss. Being a Christian doesn't get you more or less of that necessarily. It redeems all of it. That's the point. Look at what he says. He says, we're troubled, but we are given great peace. Everybody's troubled. The cool thing about being a Christian is we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're saved from the distress of all that trouble. We have a peace that passes understanding because we have Jesus. He says, we are perplexed, but we've been given purpose. We've been given a mission. You're, you have something to do with your life besides just getting enough calories to make it to another day. So many people, they reach this point in their life where the only purpose of their life is to continue to be alive. God did not put you here to convert a certain amount of oxygen into CO2. That's not what you're here for. But if your life is about your life, listen, everybody's confused. We're perplexed. We don't understand what's happening. There's so much about my own life, I do not understand. There's so much about my life that if I was really in charge, I would change it. I would do things differently. 
I wouldn't let my daughter suffer so much. I'd let Heather sleep more. And once I get done with my magic wand and my own family, there are many of you that I've promised are next in line. I don't understand why God does those things. I don't understand why he allows it to happen. I'm perplexed. But like it says here, we are perplexed, but not in despair. I'm not hopeless about it. Because I know there's a purpose. I don't understand what the purpose is, but I know that there is one. I don't know what God's doing, but I know that he is working. And I've got a mission. There's a reason to keep moving forward, even though I don't understand. There's something to do. Not in despair. I'm persecuted. The Bible says that we are persecuted. But we're given the continual presence of God with us. It says that we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Yes, you're going to face persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. But you're not going to face it alone. It's not going to be just you. There's a fourth man that goes into the fire. Continually, God will be with you. We are cast down, but saved. Do you know that even when you get cast all the way down the stairs, hit every rung in the ladder on your way down, you can't fall out of God's hands. God doesn't lose sheep. You can get cast down, but you're saved. The resurrection is a certainty for those that have trusted Christ. Look at what he says. He says, we are cast down, but not destroyed. Maybe there have been some times in your life, there have been in mine, when you were just cast all the way down. Sometimes I describe my testimony as falling all the way down the well of despair. But at the bottom, I found the rock of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I hit that and I bet. <laughs> because resurrection is a certainty. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical as well as spiritual certainty. And our resurrection, because he lives, we will too. So even when you get cast down, our life is not secure in us, and it's not secure in this world, but our life is secure in Christ. Look at what he says in verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the, abund that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For the which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and an eternal weight of glory. He says, Christian, outwardly we can be perishing. Outwardly we can be perishing, but we can be continually renewed on the inside. Even as everything falls apart, inside, continual renewal. And this affliction that we're going through, that outward perishing, it's redeemed to produce a great and eternal glory. This is one of those things that saved Christianity for me when I, you, most of you, you know my testimony how I ended up out in the hallway outside my daughter's room trying to decide if I really believed in God or not. I, I, I was too, too rattled by how, if there really was a God, how we could let my daughter just scream like that every night. I just couldn't understand it. And so I was out in the hallway and I just thought, I'm not sure if I believe any of this. My faith just fell apart brick by brick all the way down time sitting there thinking, is there really a God or did we just make this up because we're afraid of the dark? And 
And I, like I said, I hit the resurrection. I, I, couldn't, I just couldn't get over the fact that something happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Something happened. And I don't have enough faith to believe the disciples made it up. It just is too wildly implausible with what they went through, with their testimony of faithfulness, with the scriptures, with the way that God has spoken to my heart as a young person and even in my early years as an adult. And I, I'd seen too much to think that Jesus was dead. So I thought, okay. The next thing that put, put on top of that is like, well, what's the suffering for? And I'll tell you one of the things that I appreciate the most about Christianity. Most religions have some version of this. Most religions will tell you, if you do better, you'll suffer less. Or you're suffering because of some sin. Or because of your parents' sin. Or in a previous life, you were mean to a cow or something, right? There's some reason for it, and there's some solution to fix it. Most religion is very concerned with where did the suffering come from and how do we fix it. Christianity is really interesting in that it says everybody's going to suffer. That God came and suffered, but that he's going to turn that suffering into something worthwhile. In other words, it's not that your suffering isn't real. Some religions will try to tell you that too, that the suffering's all in your mind. That if you just didn't believe in the suffering, then you wouldn't suffer anymore. Oh, well, that's, that's a real thing. There's hundreds of millions of people that believe that, right? But it's not true. Suffering's super real. And when you really suffer, the idea that it's all in your head is not comforting. When you're really suffering, the idea that it's your fault and you deserve it, not comforting. The only thing I've ever found that's been comforting at all is that Jesus said, me too. I understand. Surely I have borne your griefs and carried your sorrows. And by the way, I'm going to make something out of it. Like, okay. I still don't understand why. But it's enough for me that Jesus understands and that he's going to do something with it. And that's what he's saying here. He says, For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but now from the man thrown into prison and beaten almost to death multiple times and cast outside of cities and left for dead and shipwrecked and day and night in the deep and bit by snakes and chained to guards and lied about. And he said, Our light affliction. Yeah. It's just for a moment. It worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I don't understand what it all means. But the Bible says that when we see what Jesus has taken our suffering and what he's turned it into in eternity, it's going to be so much better than the suffering, it's going to be hardly worth comparing it. I'm going to say, I can't believe I bought this much glory with this little suffering. <laughs> My daughter, when you get to see her in heaven, is going to be so glorious. You and I both are going to need sunglasses just to look at her. Right. <laughs> and some of you are going to be that way too. Because God is going to take all that suffering and he's going to turn it into something of exceedingly great glory. And the key to all this is there in verse 18. It's by looking right side up at eternity. In order to, in order to, so you say, well, how do I be troubled but have peace? How can I be perplexed but have purpose? How can I be persecuted but know the presence of God? How can I be cast down but have the hope of the resurrection? How can I be outwardly perishing but inwardly renewed? How can I know that my affliction is being redeemed into glory? The key is to be looking right side up at eternity, to begin to adjust our perspective to an eternal one instead of a temporal one. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And that's the testimony of the early church. They suffered unbelievably. 
How did they? And they did it joyfully. How? Because they weren't looking at the things that were seen. They were looking at eternity. Christian, we can do the same thing that the early church did. It's the same power and the same jars of clay. All right. Well, I preached the whole message basically on that instead of anything with Paul. So I'm going to do Paul very quickly. Living right side up. These are, as far as we know, the very last words from the Apostle Paul. He wrote them in a letter to Timothy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as far as we know, he wrote this, again, imprisoned from Rome. If you read Timothy, 2 Timothy, you'll see that he's in prison again in Rome. And we don't know if that's an extension of the imprisonment where we left him in Acts, or if, again, it's later, but in any case, he's back in prison in Rome. And he writes this letter. This time, his conditions are much worse. His imprisonment, the second time around, is much worse. But he writes a letter to Timothy. These are the last written words we have of the Apostle Paul in this life. He gives him this final charge, this final challenge from the great apostle. And here's what he says. We'll do it quickly. 2 Timothy 4, 1, 22. I charge thee, therefore. Here's the challenge. Christian, you ready for the challenge from the apostle Paul? We've been following him in Acts for a long time. Here's the challenge to Timothy. And may I say it's a challenge to you. I charge thee. I challenge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Here's the challenge. The day of reckoning approaches. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, it's close. It's coming. It was approaching then. It is approachier now. <laughs> that, isn't good, that isn't good English, but it is good preaching. <laughs> the day of reckoning comes. And listen, whether it's a revelation style trumpets and bowls of wrath on the earth, that day of reckoning is approaching also. Or whether it's just your own personal day of reckoning, we are all of us, the quick and the dead, going to stand in front of Jesus. That day is coming. So what are we to do? Preach. Preach the word. Share the gospel with people. Tell them what Jesus said. Tell them who Jesus is. Tell them what Jesus has done. Tell them about Jesus and his grace. Verse 3, for the time will come, may I say to you, it is now is, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. He says, why, why is the preaching so important? He says, well, the Bible exists. There are churches out there. Why is it so important that we preach? Because people are going to turn away to stuff that sounds nicer. They have itching ears, and they'll go to wherever they're going to get scratched. Somebody that will tell them what they already believe. Listen, if you never get challenged, that's not good. Every so often, there ought to be a challenge that comes into our heart that's different than the way that we saw things, and it's different than the way that we thought about things. Jesus ought to shock you occasionally. Because if it's all just the way that you would do it, you ought to be very suspicious that you've just invented it. Or that you're only listening to the parts that you agree with. It's okay that I have some problems with God over the way he's handled my daughter. It's okay. Because I have an honest relationship with God and I don't want to be pretending with him and I'm glad that he is not pretending with me. Heather and I, my, my dear beloved wife, we disagree on stuff occasionally. No. Yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you who's mostly right because <laughs> it's her. <laughs> but listen, I don't, I don't want somebody to just be like, oh, Josh, you're so wonderful and amazing. I mean, sometimes that's fun. And sometimes she says that. But if somebody just says that to you all the time, that can't possibly be true. No offense. Do you want to get better? Or do you just want somebody to tell you you're awesome? So what's he saying? He says, stick to the hard truths over the comforting lies. This morning, I have the best example of that this morning. I was, my alarm went off early and you know, my phone automatically adjusts. I'm getting ready for church. I'm running a little late. I'm scrambling around. I ran through. I looked at the stove on the clock and it said it was only 7.30. And I thought, oh, awesome. I've got more time than I thought. Lies. 
lies. It was a nice lie. I wish that that was true. But, but if I'd have believed the nice lie, I'd have missed Brother Vince's awesome lesson this morning. So do you want, do you want the hard truth or do you want the comforting lie? Verse 5, watch thou in all things, Paul says. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Don't quit when it gets hard. Don't quit when it gets hard. I know it's going to get hard, but that's not the time to quit. Be ready and excited to meet Jesus. One of the ways that we not quit when it's hard, he says, he says listen, they're going to turn away, but you stick to the truth. And I know it's going to get hard, but don't quit when it gets hard. He says, because we're going to see Jesus. Look at verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I love how it talks. It sounds like he's going to get on a plane and go see Jesus. Not they're going to chop his head off, which is what's going to happen. He says, I'm ready to depart. I'm not dying. I'm going somewhere better. The time of my departure is at hand. My plane's about to leave, Timothy. But I'm ready to go. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Are you excited to see Jesus? I am excited to see Jesus. The streets of gold, fine. The mansion, okay. I'm excited to see Jesus. I hope you not quit when it gets hard. And by the way, when it is hard, there's a little bit of encouragement here. God's going to be with you through every single one of those trials. Paul reminds Timothy of this in verse 15. And my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray to God that it might not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. You're going to have some lonely periods in your life when it's going to seem like everybody's gone and it's just you. But if you're a Christian, it's never just you. The Lord will stand with you. Brother Vince, the lesson this morning was so good, talking about Jesus' betrayal and delivery into the hands of the Romans. And all the disciples fled. His inner circle, his closest friends, at the hour when Jesus was at his lowest, they all left but that will never be the case for you. Christian, that'll never be the case for you. Even if everybody else goes, even if you've messed up so bad that everybody else leaves you, that nobody else wants to be seen with you, and maybe it's your fault that you're in that circumstance, even then, Jesus will stand with you. And God will see you safely home to heaven. He says, nonetheless, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, I've already been delivered out of so many things, Timothy. Now they're going to take my head, but God's going to deliver me out of that too safely home to heaven. And then the very last written words we have of the Apostle Paul are here in, in uh, 2 Timothy 4.22. He says this, The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So far as we know, those are the last words of the great Apostle from a prison cell in Rome to Timothy to us. What's it all about? All this suffering, all the missionary endeavors, all the work, all the stuff. Listen, VBS, the church building, sending missionaries to Papua New Guinea, all, all the loved ones we've had to bury, all the illness we've had to go through, all the friendships that have been ruined, all the relationships that have been wrecked, the marriages that have started and ended, all the baptisms, all the salvations, all the births. So much stuff. What's it all about? It's all about Jesus. 
It's about his grace. You're made in the image of God. And you were made for fellowship with him. And through our own sin and our own rebellion, our own hardness of heart, we turned our back on him. We used the gift of life that he gave us to break his rules. And you can't have life that way. Death is the only thing that awaits. Death and the judgment of God. But God so loved the world. He so loved you. That he came. So that he could live that life that we failed to live. And then take the punishment of death and the judgment of God that we deserved onto himself. So that he could extend that forgiveness by his grace. Not because we earned it. Not because we're good people. Not because we did enough good things. But because of his grace, he invites you to take his life in exchange for yours. And those of us that have taken Christ up on that offer, we have the opportunity to tell other people that very simple, very wonderful message about Jesus and his grace. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what it's all about. If every head bow and I'd close, we're going to have an invitation here at the end. Sister Nancy, if you're able to come and play, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But I would like to ask you to take a moment to do a little business with God. I, I know I've gone a little long. I, apparently, I wasn't ready to let go of Acts quite yet. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, brother. But, but before we go, and, and, I, and I know the pressing of the things that there are to do next maybe he's already trying to claw into your mind about what I got to get done, what we're doing next, where we're going. But could I beg you please for just a moment to put that aside for right now and to say, Lord, what did you want to speak to me about? The nature of preaching is that it's done to a, a room of people. It's done to the camera. And, and I, I have to speak to all of you as a group. But Jesus would like to speak to you individually. He, he would like to talk to just you. In a moment, I'm going to quit talking and give you a moment, if you would, for just you and just the Lord. What did God want to say to you? I wouldn't be doing my job as a, as a pastor if I didn't say that, listen, if there's somebody here and you don't know that you're saved, you're not 100% sure that you're a Christian. You can be. Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? That you're right with God? That heaven's your home? Do you know the hope of Israel? Well, if not, today could be your day. You can grab me or one of the pastors, somebody after the service. We'll take a Bible. We won't show you the church's opinion or our own opinion. We'll show you right from the Bible how you can know for sure that Jesus is your Savior, that he's going to stand with you no matter what comes. Please do that today. If you're watching the live stream, you call, you email, we'll do the same for you. If you're here and you are a Christian, you know that you're saved, your sins are forgiven, you know heaven's your home, maybe you're troubled and you need that peace that only comes from walking with Jesus. Maybe this morning you're perplexed. Like your pastor, you're just really bothered about something. And you need to be reminded of your purpose and your mission. You talk to Jesus about it. Maybe you're cast down and thrown all the way down to the bottom. This morning, you could talk to Jesus. Get your focus on the fact that you're saved, on that resurrection power that takes the dead and makes it alive. Maybe this morning, you're outwardly perishing and you need that continual renewing on the inside. You say, God, I've got to have it. Maybe this morning you're suffering some terrible affliction. I know for a fact that some of you are. And you don't want the pastor's reassurance that that suffering is going to be redeemed. You need Jesus' assurance that that suffering is going to be redeemed. You could talk to him about that right now. Maybe this morning God's trying to challenge you to preach the word. 
Maybe God's trying to challenge you to stick with the hard truths over the comforting lies. God's calling you onward to carry on and not quit. You need a vision for heaven and being excited to see his face. Or just to hear the voice of the Lord reassuring you that he's going to be there for every trial. We covered a lot of territory this morning, but what did God want to speak to you about? Use these next few moments. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. We're going to sing every single verse of it. Before we do that, take a moment and do a little business with the Lord.